Welcome to Smarter Markets, a free weekly podcast featuring stories from the entrepreneurs and icons of commodities, capital markets, and technology, ranting on the inadequacies of our systems and riffing on ideas for how to solve them. Together, we explore the questions, is capitalism in crisis, and will building smarter markets be the antidote? And now, here's your host, Eric Townsend. Welcome to the 13th episode of Smarter Markets, a weekly podcast that explores how financial markets could be redesigned and improved to better serve market participants and society as a whole. Smarter Markets is made possible by a grant from Abex Technologies. I'm your host, Eric Townsend. My guest this week will be SAP's Chief Innovation Officer and outspoken green energy proponent, Tom Raftery. Tom's job at SAP is to think about the future and also to manage the company's sustainability initiatives. We'll discuss the coming green energy revolution and what's needed to support the global economy with renewable energy resources, along with the societal and economic impact of this transition. My interview with Tom Raftery is coming up next. And now with this week's special guest, Here's your host, Eric Townsend. Tom, our audience is mostly financial professionals who know that the energy world is going to change. The Green Revolution, I think the the memo is pretty darn clear now. Everybody knows that decarbonization is a big deal. It's coming and it's going to affect especially those of us who work in trading energy markets, but it's really going to affect the entire finance community. We all know it's coming. Most of us don't really know what's coming exactly. We know some big change is coming. We know it's important and necessary to make the world a better place, but we don't really know what to expect. Let's start with the high-level overview, going you know back to why we're doing this, what has to change, why it has to change, and let's try to focus on the things that are going to affect the, the finance community and the people who trade energy products, both conventional hydrocarbon based, as well as the, the renewable energy products. Sure, sure. A uh, lot to talk about there. <laughs> um, hydrocarbons are going away, frankly. Sheikh Yamani, I think it was, the OPEC oil minister in the 1980s, uh, very famously said that the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. And similarly, the oil age will end long before we run out of oil. And he's been proven right because the oil age is ending right now. We're seeing it. We've seen we've seen peak oil happened in 2018, 2019, for example. Price has gone down. And why? Why is that happening? Well, there's a, there's a number of reasons. There's a, a concept called the carbon budget, which your listeners may or may not be aware of. But it's it's quite an interesting one because the carbon budget says that We've already agreed as a planet to limit our emissions and limit our global warming to two degrees C at worst, preferably one and a half degrees C if possible. Now, we know how much CO2 it takes to push into the atmosphere to reach, you know, two degrees C. Let's say it's around uh, a thousand gigatons. It, it, it's in and around that order of magnitude, a thousand gigatons of CO2. But the, the, the real issue, so that 1,000 gigatons of CO2 is our carbon budget. So that's, that's the idea of a carbon budget. We know how much carbon we can emit over the next X years till we get to 2 degrees C. So it, like I say, it's in the order of a thousand gigatons. But of course, that's hugely problematic because the proven reserves of the fossil fuel companies and countries is around 3,000 gigatons. So obviously, big problem there. Two thirds of today's proven reserves has to stay on the ground if we want to have a livable planet, which means, you know, there's going to be massive stranded assets for these fossil fuel companies and countries, which really has me wondering why there is still an oil exploration business or a gas exploration business when the proven reserves that we already have are already at 300 percent of what we can use. So that's that's issue number one, the, the, the carbon budget. And it's a it's a huge huge problem. We're talking writing off something like $21 trillion worth of assets. 
So, you know, that's that's a big problem right there for anyone who's in that industry. Uh, and if we do burn those assets, it's a big problem for everyone else. But we've said, as I said, that we, as a, as a planet, we have agreed not to burn those assets. So we got to do something else. And the, the something else is, you know, electrify everything and use renewables to generate that electricity. And while that sounds like a big ask, it's actually becoming easier and easier day by day. And the reason it's becoming easier day by day is because since 2010, the cost of solar has dropped about 90%. The cost of wind energy has dropped 50 to 60%. And the cost of lithium ion batteries has dropped something like 95%. So massive reductions in those costs and those cost reductions are leading to a beautiful, virtuous circle. Because if you take the cost of solar, as I said, the cost of solar has dropped uh, something like 10 to 15 percent year on year for the last 10 years. And before that, it was still drop or it was also dropping year on year and it will continue to drop year on year. Uh, as I said, it's a, it's a lovely virtuous circle because as the price drops, it becomes more attractive to more people, more people purchase it. So you get economies of scale and what economists call the learning curve or the experience curve, which leads to lower costs, which means it becomes more attractive to more people, which means, you know, you get the idea. It keeps dropping, becoming more attractive to more people, it keeps dropping. In the latest auctions for solar power in the Middle East, for example, the latest record price has been set at about 1.3 cent per kilowatt hour. And that's for a, as a power purchase agreement, a 20 year power purchase agreement. So the people who, who have bought that have said, OK, we will, we will purchase from you, the developer, electricity. We will pay 1.3 cent per kilowatt hour for the next 20 years for as much electricity as this site that you're building can produce. So the developer gets a guaranteed income of 1.3 cent per kilowatt hour. And they bid in having done all the calculations to say this is what we can bid because this will be profitable for us to develop it at this cost and to get that revenue in from it. So it's guaranteed income for them for the next 20 years. It's guaranteed pricing for the energy consumer, the energy purchaser, they're buying at a set price of 1.3 cent per kilowatt hour and getting guaranteed electricity at that price for 20 years. You know, purchasing oil or gas, you're, you've no guarantee of the, of, the, of the price, not for 20 years, certainly. Whereas with these kind of power purchase agreement auctions, you do. And the price keeps dropping. I was talking to executives from Diwa, for example, who are in that region, and they told me the cost for them of generating electricity by burning gas and they generate 90% of their electricity in Dubai, or they did at the time when I spoke to them, from burning gas, was nine cent per kilowatt hour. And in that region today, solar power purchase agreements are coming in at 1.3 cent per kilowatt hour. So right there you can see, and that, that price will continue to fall, by the way. And it, it, that, that moves you know north away from the, the equator towards the, the northern latitudes as the price keeps dropping, as we get more of the experience curve and the learning curve. So solar keeps dropping in price and gets cheaper every single year by about 10 to 15 percent. And that will continue again because of the learning curve and economies of scale. And it's not just solar wind as well. The International Energy Agency in their 2020 report said that, well, first of all, about solar, they said solar is now the cheapest form of electricity in the history of the planet. They also said that wind energy, and in fact, they, they mentioned offshore wind energy in particular, they said offshore wind energy today, looking at all of the potential sites that are all around the world for offshore wind. Offshore wind alone has the potential to generate 18 times today's current electricity demand, just offshore wind. So the International Energy Agency for, you know, decades has been incredibly conservative about renewables. And suddenly this year, their tone has started to change and they're starting to see that renewables are the path forward. And like I say, it's down to economics. If it were down to, you know, tree huggers saying, wouldn't it be great, let's go build lots of solar, then it wouldn't be sustainable because it wouldn't be financially sustainable. But because 
renewables are now coming in cheaper than fossil fuels. In fact, in, in an increasing number of regions now, it is cheaper to build a net new solar plant than it is to fuel, simply fuel an existing gas or coal plant. So you build net new and it's cheaper already. That's a huge problem for the fossil fuel industry. And now we're seeing Next Era, who Next Era are the largest electricity producer, generator, seller. I'm not sure what, which, but they're the largest one in the US. And the CEO has said recently that the combination of renewables plus battery storage is now becoming cost competitive uh, and even cheaper than oil, gas, or coal. And of course, that's a massive problem as well, because the great thing about batteries, lithium ion storage, which is what he's talking about, is that the price of that has fallen 90% since 2010, 20, 2012 as well. In 20, what was it, 2012, it was $1,100 per kilowatt hour. The most recent report from Bloomberg New Energy Finance shows that in 2020, that $1,100 per kilowatt hour has now dropped to $135 dollars per kilowatt hour. So a 90% drop in the last 10 years. So incredible fall in price. And that again will continue for exactly the same reasons. The reasons of the huge increase in economies of scale and massive experience and learning curve. In their battery day in September, Elon Musk and Tesla said that they will drop the price of batteries another 50% by 2023. In fact, if I remember correctly, I think he said it was 56% by 2023. That's three years from now, dropping at 50% in that time. And they are currently one of the, they're currently able to produce batteries cheaper than almost everybody else. So if they get it down to 50 dollars per kilowatt hour, which is roughly what they're talking about, then, you know, that that's a massive game changer, not just for Tesla, but for everybody else as well. Because when you start getting batteries at $50 per kilowatt hour, then transportation is completely changed. It's already changing enormously because batteries are becoming cheaper. But it's 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 not just for the transportation industry, but it's also for, as I talked about earlier, the likes of next year, the utilities, because suddenly they can start deploying massive battery plants, which they start they, they are starting to do. And it's starting to happen at scale. It started really for the first time in the last two, three years as batteries started to become competitive at utility scale. The first real big one was the Hornsdale Battery Reserve in South Australia, which went online I think it was late 2018, November 2018, it went online. And in the first year of operation, it made back $40 million, which for a development cost of $66 million means you're looking at an ROI of 18 months. So, you know, phenomenal. And in places where you get a huge penetration of renewables, places like, you know, Germany, parts of Australia, the UK, for example, you get to times when the wholesale price of electricity goes negative. And of course, if the wholesale price of electricity goes negative and you own a big battery plant, this is awesome because you get paid when, ele when electricity is negative, you get paid to take in that electricity. And then when the price goes positive, you get paid to, s to sell it back out again. So it's, it's, it's a complete win-win. So the the, the future of the hydrocarbon industry to your initial question, it doesn't have a future. It has zero future. It's it's going away. The question, you know, as I said, shaky man, he got it right. The oil age is over. The question is really when. And, you know, uh, my, my job title includes futurist, as, as you mentioned in the intro. One of the things you do as a futurist is you plot trend lines. And, you know, you, you see what's happened in the past, where the direction of things are going. You follow that arc out, but you can never, you can, you can say where things are going, but you can never say when things are going to get there because they, they land in, in different places at different times. Uh, I mentioned the, the cost of solar is at about 1.3 cent per kilowatt hour in the Middle East right now. But, you know, that's a more sunny area than, for example, British Columbia or the UK or, you know, Germany or places like that. So the cost of solar there isn't as low yet, but it'll get there and so on. So these things will happen in different places at different times, but inevitably they will happen because both from a, an economics perspective and a regulatory perspective, they have to happen.
Tom, I'd like to talk through the primary industries that will be affected by this, transportation, agriculture, the production of various materials such as steel and cement and aluminum and so forth. Let's take those and, and try to discuss them in terms of what they will mean to those industries and the people who work in and, and are involved in, in the commodities transactions which occur in them. Let's start with transportation because that's the big one. That's where we consume most of the energy. And if you go back just 10 years ago, a widely accepted argument that people would say, look, you've got this liquid fuel problem where as much as it would be wonderful if we could just go green and in renewables and it all sounds good. But the thing is for transportation, you've got this energy density problem where you need to have liquid fuels to power vehicles because it'll never be practical. At least that was the view at the time to use batteries to store sufficient energy to run vehicles. Well, then we got electric cars, and the argument was, well, okay, you can do that for a little Tesla Roadster, which only weighs a 1,000 pounds, but you'd never be able to do it for a truck that's actually carrying 80,000 pounds of freight down the highway, and especially if it has to drive up a hill to go, you know, to cross the Rocky Mountains. Never happened. Well, I don't think that's happened quite yet, but we certainly are seeing progress in that area. Uh, another argument that was made is air transportation. Absolutely impossible for it ever to go electric because there's just no way from an energy density standpoint to ever store enough energy in batteries to fly an airliner across the Pacific Ocean. Just, just impossibility. That was 10 years ago. How many of those things are still impossibilities and how many of them have turned out to be possible after all? Yeah, a good question. We are seeing a huge shift. I mentioned that the batteries had dropped, you know, 90% cost in the last 10 years. So they went from $1,100 per kilowatt hour to about 130 uh, this year, and they will continue to fall. But what I didn't mention was not alone have the batteries got cheaper, but they've also massively increased their energy density. The energy density of those batteries is increasing at about 5 to 8% per annum and continues to increase. They've tripled energy density density since 2010. So one great example I'd like to showcase with that is I, I have a slide when I'm giving presentations on this of a vehicle called the Renault Zoe. I happen to use that because it's the best selling EV here in Europe. I also use it because I happen to have the numbers for that particular vehicle. And basically, the Renault Zoe small town car launched in 2012. So version one launched in 2012. It had a a range when it launched of a 145 kilometers with a 22 kilowatt hour battery. You know, like I say, small town car, small range, it was 2012. Version two of the car launched in 2016. Version two had a 42 kilowatt hour battery and a range of about 250, 270 kilometers. So significant improvement in, in four years. Version three of the car launched in late 2019. Version three had a 52 kilowatt hour battery and now a range approaching 400 kilometers. So in the seven years from 2012 to 2019, it went from 145 kilometers to 400 kilometers and a 22 kilowatt hour battery to a 52 kilowatt hour battery. But what's even more impressive is in the same time, it didn't increase in price. And even more interestingly, it still uses the same battery housing. So in the battery housing in 2012 that held the 22 kilowatt hour battery, they can now fit a 52 kilowatt hour battery. So the battery technology has increased to allow much more energy density and the, the reduction in cost means it stayed the same price. Now, that means that in 2023 or 2024, when version four of the Zoe comes out, it could have a range of six to 700 kilometers at the same price, same same battery housing or not. They might do, decide to do something else. I don't know. But, you know, you get the point. The battery technology is increasing such that the range of these vehicles is increasing while the cost drops or stays the same. 
To your point about larger vehicles, we're seeing the launch this year, so 2020 and 21, we're seeing the launch of things like the Volkswagen ID4, uh, the Polestar 2, the Jaguar I-Pace has been out for a while, the Mercedes EQC has been out a year. You know, these are all big cars. These are big SUVs. The Cybertruck is coming supposedly next year. The ID4, as I mentioned, the Volkswagen, oh, and you've got the Skoda, the, uh, what's the Skoda called? ENIAC and, you know, a whole bunch of them in that kind of size range. And they have battery ranges of four to 500 kilometers. The ID4 is rated at over 500 kilometers, for example. So that issue of range in larger vehicles has gone away, again, through technological advancements in battery technology. You mentioned trucks like the, uh, the, the was it class 40 vehicles, the 18 wheel trucks, the Tesla Semi, has shown in testing that it can go between five and 800 miles on a charge and with a full load, depending on which battery configuration it has on it. There's an issue there around the weight of the batteries, particularly in Europe and European regulations around weight, which might mean they might not be able to carry as many or as much cargo. But I suspect that it, the, the, the difference between the loaded weight of the truck with the batteries on it uh, might mean it might need to carry half a ton less than it would fully loaded. And I think by the time it launches here in Europe, the battery technology will have advanced so much that that half ton difference will have gone away. So then you will have trucks like the Tesla Semi uh, in two, three years on the road, capable of traveling, as I say, depending on the battery configuration, either five or 800 miles. So that's well over a thousand kilometers, which is more than it's legal for drivers to drive in a single day anyway. So that, that problem goes away right there. Are they on the road today? Not yet, only in only in prototype mode, but they have been demonstrated to do that. So getting to production is just a matter of scaling that up. Now, we've all seen what happens getting taking something from prototype to production with the Model 3 and what Elon Musk called production hell. But Tesla are not the only person in that game either. We've also got all the other big truck makers in that space, Daimler, Scania, Volvo, they're all at it and they will all get there. People are talking about a shift to hydrogen for trucks. I don't see it happening. I don't see it happening because technology in batteries is moving so fast that by the time they've developed a hydrogen truck, which is as good, the batteries will already be there. And then you do away with the problem of infrastructure Electricity is ubiquitous. Hydrogen is not. Hydrogen is also extremely expensive. So to fill a hydrogen truck with hydrogen costs way more than filling an equivalent diesel truck with diesel, which costs way more than filling an equivalent electric truck with electrons. You know, so just in terms of the economics alone, battery trucks are going to be where the market moves to because they cost you know, to fuel a battery truck costs probably a third of what it would cost to fuel it with diesel, which probably costs, uh, let's say, 50 percent of what it costs to fill it with hydrogen. So and that's just the fuel costs, the maintenance costs as well. Maintenance on an electric vehicle, according to Consumer Reports report, which came out in September this year, talking about EVs. They're about 50% of the cost of an internal combustion engine vehicle. So, you know, and maintenance is a massive factor in the in fleets. So any fleet manager is looking at getting the cost of fuel and maintenance. Those are the two big costs they're looking to hit on. And of course, with fuel being electrons much cheaper than diesel and maintenance being half the cost, fleets are going to flip to electric much, much faster than even passenger vehicles. Tom, let's talk about the infrastructure build out that's needed in order to make this a reality, because clearly the electric vehicle revolution is gaining traction. It's got legs. This thing's going someplace. But look, in almost all developed countries in the world, including the United States and Europe, you don't have sufficient electrical grid capacity to recharge you know, if everybody had one of these right, right now, it's it's like one or two percent of the population has an EV charging. It doesn't matter if we had even a, a 10 percent adoption rate of EVs, the, the electric grids would fall over and break. We need to upgrade them. 
How does that happen? And, and I mean, that's a very expensive public infrastructure project. It seems like, fortunately, we kind of have a good economic backdrop and a political backdrop that wants to support big infrastructure projects. But there's a big, big capital investment that's needed to get the world ready to recharge all of these electric vehicles. How does that happen? That's a myth, frankly. That's not a concern at all. So the reason I say that is National Grid says it. So National Grid uh, in the UK have come out and, well, they, they came out and said a couple of years ago when the UK government said we are going to outlaw the sale of internal combustion engine vehicles in 2040, they consulted with National Grid and National Grid said, make it 2035. You know, we don't see any problem with it. So the UK government said, okay, we'll make it 2035. And then National Grid said, you can make it 2030 if you want. We don't see any problem with it. So there is zero problem. Uh, I have an EV. Why does why do so many people uh, think that that is a major impediment to EV <laughs> the, adoption? The, there, are, there are a lot of interested parties who don't want to see electric vehicles in the market. You can think of traditional automakers as number one. You can think of fossil fuel companies as number two. Both of them lose significant amounts of money if the world goes to electric vehicles. So you can see lots of inverted commas studies close inverted commas which show evs to be a bad thing but you actually talk to the people in the markets the people like national grid they say not a problem and as i say i have an ev we're a single car family the only car we have is a fully electric car i have a seven kilowatt charger on the wall in the front of my house I also have a standard two-pin plug. Now, Europe, we're 220 volts, but I have a standard two-pin plug in the garage where I plug in the car, where I can plug in the car, which, where I do normally. And it's just a standard wall plug. You know, I have, beside it, I have a fridge, you know, to, to keep beer cold. Uh, so it's exactly the same plug that I could plug a Hoover into or vacuum cleaner or any of these things. That's where I charge the car the majority of the time. And I charge it during the day, typically because of a five kilowatt solar array on my roof. So I, I choose to charge it during the day when I can just pull electrons straight from the solar panels on the roof. I could charge it overnight if I wanted. The thing is, Eric, you've got to understand, most people are not driving, you know, more than 100 kilometers a day. So my car does about 6.4 kilometers per kilowatt hour. So let's make that Let's say it's five. Let's say it's, it's, you know, not really good and it only does five kilometers per kilowatt hour. So that's 20 kilowatt hours to do 100 kilometers, if my maths are right. <laughs> I was never great at maths. So 20 kilowatt hours. If I am plugging it into that two pin plug in the wall, that's a two kilowatt plug, standard plug in the wall, two kilowatts. That means it takes 10 hours to charge it. That's an overnight charge on a standard, a standard plug in the wall, 10 hours. You know, that's a nighttime charge. I could do that every night and, and drive 100 kilometers every day and plug it in every night and, you know, it'll be fully charged in the morning. If, okay, you talk about tripping substations or things like that, two kilowatts is what a hairdryer pulls. You know, if turning on hairdryers is going to trip the local substation, we've got bigger problems. You know, like I say, National Grid are already saying this is not a problem. Most people's charging, most people's, let's put it like this, most people's fueling habits with electric vehicles are very different to the fueling patterns you have when you have a car that runs on hydrocarbons. You just you just top it up whenever you need to. You know, you don't you don't let it go down to close to empty and then fill it back up. You know, you just as you, you get home at night, plug it in, go into the house, come out the next morning to a full tank again. And like I say, the full tank in the cars that are on sale now is four to five hundred kilometers. So you wake up in the morning with four to 500 potential kilometers. If you have to drive more than that, you find a fast charger somewhere, which, you know, with today's cars can charge, can fill the car in 20 to 30 minutes. And if you've driven four or 500 kilometers, you're going to want a 20 or 30 minute break in your driving schedule anyway. Let's move on to the batteries themselves and particularly the materials needed to build them. Because a lot of people in finance are saying, okay, it seems like 
maybe the bottleneck here is the lithium. We got plenty of lithium for the batteries we're building right now. But if you're talking about the whole world is going to have EVs, that's a lot of lithium ion batteries. And that means a whole lot of lithium. And that means that lithium mining and the whole process for producing lithium is going to become a critical path to the economy. Now, I have to take a pause there and say, wait a minute, I've done a little bit of reading about some new experimental battery chemistry projects, and they're nowhere close to ready for prime time right now. But lithium ion batteries were not ready for prime time 15 years ago. And now you know, everybody's forgotten about NICAD batteries and whatever came before that. Do we run a risk of everybody focusing on lithium only to find out that lithium's not really the battery material after all because something better comes along? Yeah, I mean, that's a possibility. Uh, I don't see it as a big probability. I mean, maybe down the line, 10, 15 years, sure. But to your own point, I, I think lithium ion batteries first came out in around 1990. I think that's when the researcher, I think his name is John Goodenough curious surname, but I think that's when he first mooted kind of lithium ion batteries, might have been even earlier. So that gives us a 30 year window to get from that to, you know, EVs. So if we're looking at another 30 year window, we're up to 2050 before some other battery technology, which, you know, may come out, gets to something similar, or maybe, maybe, you know, technology accelerate and we get there in 15 to 20 years. It, it still means the lithium that we're using today and we're mining today has a, has a long life ahead of it. And that pathway, you know, is, is still going quite strong. There are solid state batteries which are being tried out today. Some of those technologies are starting to mature. Will they take over from lithium mine batteries? Quite possibly. Will they use lithium? Quite possibly. We don't know. But for now, there's still a huge runway left for lithium. And given that it's the fourth most abundant element on the planet, uh, I don't see any shortages long term with lithium. The biggest bottlenecks, as you rightly alluded to, are the mining. There aren't enough lithium mines on the planet yet, but, you know, it doesn't take that long to spin up a big mine. Uh, you're talking two, three years maximum. So that'll happen pretty fast too. There are plans for, I don't know, is it 30 or 40 gigafactories, the types of gigafactory that uh, Tesla have in Nevada. So there's, there's plans for like 30 or 40 of those to come online in the next five to 10 years to meet the demand that the car makers are going to have. Because as I said, the, the costs of these batteries are falling. They're rapidly becoming cost competitive with internal combustion engine vehicles on an upfront cost, never mind the total cost of ownership, the, the running costs. So they, they are going to take over pretty quickly. Already two-wheelers, motorbikes, 30% of global sales of motorbikes are electric today. Buses are going electric even faster than passenger cars because, again, it's all around the economics of fueling and maintenance. And fleets of vehicles for, you know, company cars will go the same way for the same reason very quickly as well. And some of them are getting incentives as well. The benefit and kind tax in the UK went away in April of this year for electric cars. So, you know, suddenly electric cars became extremely extremely popular in the UK. And, you know, things like that will happen along with the Green New Deal in Europe as well. It'll happen very fast. Let's move on to agriculture, which is probably the next big consumer of energy after transportation. We use diesel fuel to run the farm equipment. Also, to some extent, the fertilizers are produced from petroleum products. How does a, a green revolution affect the agriculture industry? Yeah, it's a complex one, really. Um, there are a lot of inputs into agriculture, as you rightly say. There's the, the fertilizers, pesticides, seeds, water, sunlight, land, uh, the whole thing. The land use itself is a massive carbon problem because typically what happens is you you take down virgin forest, you turn it into agricultural land, so you're straight away taking away a massive carbon sink. And you were seeing that happen in places like the Amazon, Indonesia, places like that at, at horrific rates. And then you have all the agricultural inputs I mentioned earlier. And there are things then like the production of meat. So the kind of deforestation that we're seeing in Amazonia, for example, a lot of that is being done to either produce land to graze cattle or land to produce soya to feed to cattle to produce beef. You know, so massively, massively destructive and inefficient means of producing protein for us to eat. 
ways around that are, well, first of all, for plant food, we're seeing a start of a move to vertical farming. I have a, for, for my Climate 21 podcast, I have an interview lined up with a, the CEO of a company called Endeavor. And Endeavor operate out of Kuwait. And they have a big vertical farm right at the edge of Kuwait City, where they're producing 500 kilos of fresh greens per day in a huge indoor vertical farm. And the advantage of doing it in a big indoor vertical farm is you get massive, massive density of food production in a very small land footprint because you're stacking them vertically. You're using artificial light. So you're using LEDs and the artificial light means you can change day length to your suiting. The advantage of that is, and you know, I'm a graduate plant scientist, I'm a botanist. So I strayed into technology after after my, my, my postgrad. But the advantage of being able to completely control day length is day length is what plants use to deduce what season it is. So you can be telling plants it's the middle of winter by changing day length when it's actually the middle of summer and you're in Kuwait and it's 50 degrees C outside. You know, so you you can you can completely control the environment the plants are in. You control temperature, you control CO2 levels, you control light. Because you're indoors, you can control ventilation, you can control pests access. So you no, no longer need to use pesticides. You no longer need to use herbicides because there are no weeds. Uh, you feed the plants aquaponically or similar aeroponically. So your water is about 90% less and your land use is 95% less and you're producing completely organic food. And if you're producing it right at the edge of the city where it's going to be consumed, your food miles are drastically reduced. You're no longer producing fruit in Hawaii and selling it in Europe, for example. You know, you're, you're producing it right where it's going to be consumed. And because you can produce it right where it's going to be consumed, you now, as a plant breeder, no longer need to concern yourself with shelf life. A lot of the foods, a lot of the plant foods that we eat today are bred for maximum shelf life. Instead, as a plant breeder, now if you're producing in a vertical farm right beside where it's going to be produced, you could probably, you know, optimize your plants for something like nutrition or taste, you know, or something actually nice like that or good for us. Uh, so there, there's there are those upsides to vertical farming. And then, as I said, Massively reduced land use, massively reduced CO2 footprint, massively reduced herbicides, pesticides, etc. Then, though, the other problem we have is meat production. And meat production, to my earlier point about, you know, grazing cattle on former forests or cutting down forests to grow soya to feed to the cattle, instead of cutting down the forests, grow that soya in massive indoor vertical farms and use that to feed the cattle. Or... Better again, use what's called clean meat. So massive indoor vertical farms, one huge area of investment for the, for the food industry right now. The other is clean meat. What's clean meat? Clean meat is meat that has been produced by either using plant protein and converting it into what seems to be meat. So the likes of Beyond Foods or Impossible Burgers, or alternatively, take some cells from living animals, like a biopsy on a human, take those cells, put them into a bioreactor and grow them into meat. And that's the technology that has recently been legalized for consumption in Singapore in the last couple of weeks. The restaurants were licensed to serve chicken meat that had been grown from live chickens in bioreactors. And I've forgotten the name of the company who has gotten the license to do this. But this is going to be increasingly a thing as well. And if you are able to produce chicken meat from chicken cells without having to slaughter millions of chickens per year, that's a nice win for, you know, the chickens. <laughs> but it means less slaughter, less cruelty to, to chickens because these chickens are held in horrific conditions. These chickens and other livestock that are bred for slaughter are held in such horrific conditions that they are in fact injected with antibiotics to make sure they don't get sick. Not because they're sick, but we know they're going to get sick. So we prophylactically inject them with antibiotics. In fact, 80% of the world's antibiotics today are used in agriculture. 
to make sure the food we are going to consume does not get sick before we consume it. Which of course means that there's huge runoff of antibiotics from these farms, we'll call them, into the local rivers, which means that suddenly we're getting massive growth of multi-drug resistant bacteria. And it comes in our food as well. We're starting to eat the antibiotics that, that come off that. And it goes into the waterways and the fish start to develop resistance, you know. So it becomes a massive pollution problem. So we do away with all of that if we produce our meat in clean forms. And of course, if we're taking plant food that has especially been produced in massive indoor vertical farms and cut out the animal side of it altogether and just go straight to producing animal protein from plant protein, the likes of what Impossible Foods and Beyond Burger are doing. It's a far more efficient method of producing protein that we consume. And again, we then massively, massively reduce our land usage because we're not grazing cattle and we're not growing soya, for example, to, to produce those animals. So we're hugely reducing our land use so we can return that land to a biodiversity, which we have reduced by about 60 percent globally since 1970, and B, we can re return it to reforestation. And of course, reforestation means that we can start to suck back out of the atmosphere a lot of the CO2 that we put in there by A, removing the forests in the first place, and B, pumping CO2 into the air from the tailpipes of the cars we drive and from agriculture and from, you know, to your area point, steel and iron, cement, aluminium. By the way, aluminium is the correct pronunciation. <laughs> <laughs> Production. I was going to ask you that next, actually, because there are several industries that are very near and dear to the hearts of many of our listeners in the commodity business. Uh, the production of steel is very, very energy intensive. Concrete is a very energy intensive. Aluminum <laughs> is a very. <laughs> I can. Wait, I'll ignore your speech to you. <laughs> it's okay. Um, I can say aluminium if 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 you like. Um, but one way or another, it consumes a huge amount of electricity to produce it. What are the implications on these industries of this coming decarbonization? They're significant. But again, these industries are aware that this is happening and aware that they have to change and they are starting to make their first attempts at that change. One of the big problems they have, obviously, is they require huge amounts of heat to smelt metal into steel or iron, whatever it is, and bauxite into aluminium slash aluminum. So what are we doing today? Massively today, we are using coal, uh, coke coal, which makes no sense because what it means is we're burning rocks to melt rocks. You know, it's ridiculous. What should we be doing? Well, one thing that we can do is use hydrogen. And I've been very sceptical about hydrogen in most industries, particularly transportation up until now. But hydrogen, I think, will play a role perhaps in some maritime settings, probably in aviation, which we skipped over. But big time, I think hydrogen will have a role in the likes of the smelting industries the and, and cement in producing high heat in industry. Now, the problem with hydrogen today is 95% of the world's hydrogen today is produced by steam fracturing methane. So if 95% of it is produced by fracturing what is a fossil fuel, well, then hydrogen today is a de facto fossil fuel. And that is obviously a big problem. But I did mention, obviously, earlier on that renewables cost keeps falling and it's falling 10 to 15 percent year on year on year, which means we're going to get to a point where the cost of electricity generation is close to zero. It's, it's like uh, the cost of taking a photograph. Back in the 90s and even the early 2000s, there was a definite cost to taking a photograph. You know, you had to buy a roll of film and it had 12 or 18 or 24 or sometimes 36 photographs you could have on that roll of film, you know, and you loaded them into your camera and you were very careful to make sure you framed everything absolutely properly. And then you 
took that picture and you took the next 11 or 17 or whatever it was, you brought them down to the local pharmacy or wherever to get them processed. You got them back a week or two later and you, you carefully went through those 18 or 24 or 36 pictures, looked to see how many of them actually came out. There was a huge cost to taking photographs. Today, there is zero cost to taking photographs. We all now walk around with thousands or tens of thousands of photographs on our phone. And that's going to happen to energy as well. The cost of energy is tending towards zero because, as I mentioned, today it's 1.3 cent per kilowatt hour in Saudi. Uh, that, as I say, that will work its way north as the cost of solar keeps dropping. So energy costs, the cost of generation of electricity is going to continue going closer. It'll never reach zero, obviously, but it'll keep getting closer and closer and closer to zero through solar and wind. And what do we do when we have, you know, almost zero cost energy? Well, there's a number of things we can do. We can use it, for example, to desalinate seawater and use it to irrigate deserts and turn them back into productive agricultural land again. Or we can use it to create hydrogen by hydrolysis and then store that hydrogen in something like ammonia for transportation and use that as an energy source for the likes of steel, cement, aluminum slash aluminium. <laughs> you know, so that I think is where hydrogen has a place to play. It's, it, it's what's called green hydrogen because it's been produced by excess renewables. And we're already seeing, as I mentioned earlier, there are times when the cost of electricity on the wholesale market goes negative. So we are seeing times when we do have excesses of electricity from renewables already today. And in some places, what happens is instead of going negative, they just curtail the renewable generators, which makes no sense. What makes a lot more sense is to take the extra electricity they're generating and use it to create something useful, either use it to fill a battery or use it to create something that can be used subsequently, like hydrogen in this case. Let's talk about how the energy gets produced. Obviously, long term, it would be wonderful to say it's 100% renewables, it's wind, it's solar, there's enough of it to supply the entire planet, everybody's got all the energy they need, and it's you know quarter of a set of a kilowatt hour to, to buy it. We're not there yet, and we're not going to get there overnight. Now, in terms of the transition of how we get from today to there, and particularly what it's going to mean for different kinds of energy fuels that are consumed... One of the big trends that I've heard about is burning less coal in favor of more natural gas to whatever extent you've got to burn fossil fuels in order to create electricity. It's a heck of a lot more ecologically friendly to do that with natural gas instead of coal. Uh, I've heard talk of a nuclear renaissance as well, including this idea of modularized mini nuclear reactors that are built in a factory someplace and uh, they're self-diagnosing and computerized in a very much uh, new generation of technology that makes them much safer than the old Westinghouse 1970s reactors. Obviously, I understand that your long-term vision is we get rid of all that stuff in favor of all renewables, but what's the path from here to there? Again, it's, it's kind of probably different paths in different places. Nuclear will have a part to play. Um, there could very well be small modular reactors that somebody actually manages to invent and get to market and roll out at scale. Might happen. You know, it, it's one of those things that I like to call unicorn farts, you know, could well happen, could well smell gorgeous, but might never happen either. And right now, I don't see any, even in prototype, never mind in production. And will they get to production at scale if they do? If they do, you know, excellent. I, I have nothing against nuclear. In theory, what I do have against nuclear is in practice, it doesn't scale and it costs a fortune. So what do I mean by it doesn't scale? Well, the largest offshore wind park in the world is being built in a place called the Dogger Bank off the coast of the UK today. It's a 3.6 gigawatt wind, wind farm. It's being built with the GE Heliide X wind turbines, which are massive 12 megawatt wind turbines. As I say, it's being built. It's going to take two to three years to go from plans to actual production of electricity two to three years to go from plans to a 3.6 gigawatt wind farm. Now, there's another 
plant in the UK called Hinkley C. Hinkley C is a nuclear power plant, which has been on the drawing board for probably 10 to 15 years at this point. EDF are heavily involved in the production of it. The latest optimistic estimates say it will come online hopefully by 2030. It will be so far over budget, no one even has you know, enough zeros on their calculator at this point to, to know how far over budget it has gone. Uh, it will come in at 3.5 gigawatts nameplate. So less than the wind farm. We're looking at somewhere between 20 and 30 years to go from drawing plans to online. So, you know, right there, you've got a huge, huge problem. We're seeing plans for 20 gigawatt solar farms in northern Australia, uh, 30 gigawatt combined solar and wind farms being built, actually 35 gigawatt solar and uh, wind farms being built in India. Uh, so, you know, when you've got wind farms and solar plants that are, you know, 20 and 35 gigawatts, whereas a normal typical nuclear reactor is one gigawatt, a combined three and a half in Hinkley C is taking 20 to 30 years to build, then nuclear today has some serious issues. And I don't see a quick path to resolution for that. I'm sure lots of people are talking about building modular ones. I haven't seen any working one yet, never mind production at scale. So for, you know, the next 10 to 15 years, because it will take that length of time to get those modular ones, if they exist, from prototype to scale production. So in the next 10 to 15 years, renewables are going to have taken over because, like I said, we're already we already have plans to roll out 35 gigawatt solar and wind in India. Th those plans are moving ahead. That 20 gigawatt solar plant in northern Australia is going ahead. It's got the funding. It is going ahead. They're going to use that. They're going to put a huge battery beside it. So it'll be able to store a lot of its energy in the battery. They're drawing a cable west, east, east from it to power the city of Darwin. And they're drawing a three and a half thousand kilometer cable north to power Singapore from this solar plant in, Northern, in the Northern Territories in Australia. These are the kinds of projects that it's possible to do with renewables that you could not even dream of doing with nuclear. So nuclear, yeah, nuclear will have a part to play, but a bit part, not a big part, a very small part, unless, to your point, small modulars come online, but that's not going to happen, as I say, for 10 to 15 years, given the scale of time it takes to go from the prototypes that they're at at the moment to production if they get there. What about getting rid of coal burning electric power generation in favor of natural gas, at least until we can get to a fully renewable solution? Coal is going away. Uh, there's no doubt about that. And it's going away again, not for reasons of, uh, you know, tree huggers. It's going away for reasons of economics. Uh, it's going away in large part as well because the investment community are running a mile from coal. You know, you, you've seen the announcement from BlackRock and similar the investment community, asset managers want nothing to do with coal and they want very little to do with anything that has a significant carbon footprint, which includes gas. Or if it doesn't include gas in their portfolios today, it will tomorrow. Because one of the problems with gas is not just the emissions from the burning of the gas, but the methane leakage, which are going to be required to report soon as well. So methane leakage is the kind of dirty secret of the gas community. And like I say, it's going to be mandated to report that pretty soon. So the gas... The, the carbon footprint of gas is going to increase. And even if it doesn't, even if that doesn't happen, the fact that it has a carbon footprint is going to be problematic for the investment community. So I don't see gas having a long-term future. It might have a short-term future, but while it's now cheaper to roll out renewables in most geographies than gas, renewables are going to take over. Gas may last another five to 10 years, but it's got a, it's got a short-term future at best. Tom, there's another aspect of how the world is changing that I want to talk about, which is we're not just looking at a change in electric vehicles, but already Uber and the other ride sharing services have made a profound difference in how people use transportation. Now the new thing that a lot of people are talking about, and it's already being prototyped, are fully autonomous, you know, taxi cabs that have no driver. Uber's doing some experimental work with that. And there's also everything from drone delivery of pizzas to, I mean, the, the, there's all kinds of things happening around automation of transportation where we might not need to use 
the same, you know, do you, do you still need your car, your, your plug-in electric to go to the supermarket for that extra gallon of milk? Or does the milk come to you by drone delivery? What's the future look like? Yeah, it's, it's really fascinating. And, you know, as an individual, I am attracted to this area, not because I'm interested in transportation or cars or, you know, I'm not a petrol head or anything like that, but it's because so much disruption is happening here. And because I'm very ADD, I, I like places where there's disruption because there's new things happening all the time. So it's a great place to look into. And to your point, there's an enormous amount happening in, in autonomy of vehicles. You said Uber, correct, Waymo are another one. And Waymo are really interesting. Uh, Zooks are another one that got bought recently by Amazon. Waymo are really interesting because if you look at the amount of miles that these autonomous vehicles that are being tested can do without having an issue where a human driver has to step in and take over, Waymo are way ahead of everybody else in the space in terms of the amount of miles that they, they, they can travel, you know, five, six thousand miles without somebody having to step in, whereas everyone else is at about one to two thousand miles. And why is that important? Well, it's important because Waymo's ambition in this space is breathtaking. It really is. John Kraftcheck, the CEO of Waymo, has said that they want Waymo to be powering everything that has two wheels and can run on the surface of this planet. Not just two wheels, anything that has wheels and can run on the surface of the planet. So that's not just passenger vehicles, that's anything. And, you know, to that point, a company called Neuro was set up by some former Google engineers. And I'm sorry, Waymo was owned by Google fully. So some of these former engineers went off and set up a delivery company called Neuro and the vehicle they created, fully autonomous, is only big enough to take deliveries. A person can't sit in it. It's not big enough to take a driver. So the idea is you open up the Neuro app on your phone. Sorry, no, you open up the, the Kroger app on your phone because they've done a deal with Kroger to do deliveries for Kroger. Or you open up the Domino's Pizzas app on your phone because they've done a deal with Domino's to deliver pizzas for Domino's. So you open up one of those apps, order your pizza or your groceries. They're put into this little Neuro vehicle, which arrives at your door 15 minutes later. And, you know, th th that starts to be a huge change. And this, the idea for Waymo is that th these are all devices powered by Waymo. Now, if you cast your mind back to 2008, so 12 years ago, 2008 was when Google launched Android. And along with iOS, see what that did to the mobile phone space. Now, think forward 10 years and think Waymo taking over and see the disruption that it's likely to do to the transportation space because they see Waymo as powering all transportation. So like I said, the breadth of their ambition in this space is astounding. The, the cool thing about this space as well is there are a huge number, well, there aren't a huge number, but there are several big business models out there. So if you think of, for example, GM, GM have their cruise project where what they want to do is they want to do vehicle as a service where instead of selling you a GM car, they have an Uber-like app that you download. You open up the cruise app on your phone. You book a cruise vehicle. It arrives at your front door, takes you where you want to go. You get out and you pay the same way you would with Uber. So, you know, it's, it's similar to Uber. It just happens to be cruise. Uh, there's no driver. So it's cheap and for GM, the attraction of this is they get to keep getting money from the vehicles that they own. So if for them, it's a transition from selling vehicles to selling the utility of the vehicles, what's called product as a service or mobility as a service in this case, or, tra or vehicle as a service or transportation as a service. There are all these kinds of different names for it, but it means the same thing. The car maker stops selling the cars and starts selling the utility of those vehicles. Why is that attractive to the likes of GM? Well, if you think back 10 years, 10 years ago, when GM sold a vehicle, they could reasonably expect to earn $30,000 from that vehicle over the lifetime of that vehicle in parts, in repairs, in maintenance, in spares, etc. Now, 
10 years later, that 30,000 has shrunk significantly and keeps shrinking. Why is it shrinking? It's shrinking because vehicles are going electric. Electric cars have far fewer parts and require far less maintenance. So right there, you've got a percentage of that 30,000 has shrunk. Then we're seeing things added to cars like lane assist, parking assist, all these new features that are making the cars more secure and meaning they crash less. So if less spares, less repairs over the lifetime of the vehicle. And as we get more advanced vehicles, we're getting fewer people buying vehicles. So the number of those 30,000 is shrinking as well. So that 30,000 is shrinking year on year on year. So instead of selling cars or as well as selling cars, they're going to go the car as a service route where they give you the car to use and they charge you for the use of that vehicle. We're seeing several car companies move to this space already. If I go to my local Volkswagen Spain, I'm based in Spain. If I go to the Volkswagen Spain website, for example, I can get their ID3 today for 350 euros per month. For that 350 euros per month, I get the car. I get tax, insurance, maintenance, uh, mileage, all covered. And if I get any fines or any tolls, the payment of those is managed and it comes, you know, it's added on to my next month's 350 euros. So the whole management of that is, is handled by Volkswagen as well. And they're not the only ones. Volvo and a number of others are doing this for that kind of reason. They want to keep that 30,000, you know, not from the lifetime of the vehicle, but rather get an, a monthly guaranteed income from the vehicles. There's also, interestingly, when when you go the vehicle as a service route, suddenly the issue of data ownership becomes moot. Because today, if Volkswagen, if I buy an ID3 or an ID4 from Volkswagen, I'm buying it from the dealer who's, you know, whose only affiliation is they've got a franchise to sell the vehicle from Volkswagen. So my my dealing is with the dealership. So I'm the customer of the dealership. I'm not Volkswagen's customer. They have no direct relationship with me, so they have no access to the data from my vehicle. But if I rent the vehicle, I rent it directly from Volkswagen, not from the dealership. The dealership and, and Volkswagen have changed the contract with all their dealerships and not just them. I'm sure all the other OEMs have done it as well so that I am Volkswagen's customer and the dealer acts like a concierge for the service. So suddenly now, as ownership resides with Volkswagen or Volvo or whoever else, they also own the data. And that's a huge interest to them. But you asked about uh, drones as well. Actually, before we get onto that, we mentioned other business models. Waymo's business model is to power everything and they are not going to have the vehicles. They're going to sell the software. They might have a few vehicles themselves, the way, for example, they have the Android phone that they sell out or they, they sell today. But for the vast majority, they'll be powering the driving of other vehicles of whatever sort it is. Then you've got Tesla. Tesla's model is slightly different again because they want to sell you the vehicle and then they want to they want you to add your vehicle to their Tesla network and it, do a revenue share on that. So that's a different business model yet, yet again. Why is transportation as a service so interesting? It's interesting and it's going to have huge impacts because Similar to energy, as we talked about earlier, similar to photographs, as we talked about earlier, the cost of transportation is going to zero. Why is it going to zero? Well, it's going to zero because 50% of the cost of a taxi, for example, today is the taxi driver. Remove the taxi driver from the equation right away. That's 50% of the cost gone. Then insurance. Well, you know, autonomous vehicles should cost far less to insure. And in any case, if they're autonomous, it's the vehicle manufacturer who is liable for the insurance, not the owner of the vehicle, which might be two different parties. You take away the or you significantly reduce the fuel costs because they're electric. You significantly reduce the maintenance costs because they're electric and so on. So the cost to operate a, an autonomous vehicle today is five to 10 percent of the cost of a driven vehicle. So that has huge implications because as the as the cost of transportation tends towards zero, anyone can get into transportation. You know, the example could be what if I open up Starbucks on my phone and I order a grande latte and Starbucks send it to me in an autonomous vehicle. And when the autonomous vehicle gets to me, it says, can I take you anywhere today? And you say, yes, I'd like to go to work. And they say, well, hop in. It's covered in the cost of the grande latte. You hop in, you are driven to your place of work or your shopping or whatever it is you want to do. And while you're in there, 
the vehicle upsells you on a granola bar or a croissant or whatever it is, you know, and why not? You know, it, it costs Starbucks little to nothing to offer that service because transportation is almost free and they get the opportunity to upsell you on extra things as you're captive within the vehicle. You know, so and, and I've no idea if Starbucks have even thought about this, but that's just an example of the way business models are shifting. And of course, then we get the, the whole idea of drones. Uber are massive in that space as well, because they see the shift to drones taking people where they want to go. And in some cases, in some places, Going in drone taxis will happen before going in autonomous taxis because autonomous taxis move in 2D space. And that's quite difficult because they're in a very dynamic environment and they have to have hyper local millimeter or sub millimeter resolution mapping of that space. And it's a dynamic environment, so it has to be real time mapping. Whereas drones are operating in 3D space, which is a very different scenario. And the mapping doesn't have to be as precise. You have to have absolutely vehicle to everything communication. You have to have collision avoidance systems, sure. But it's actually easier to roll out drones in cityscapes than it is to roll out autonomous vehicles on the ground. So I could see in many cities, drone taxis happening before autonomous taxis. Boy, you just got the wheels turning. I can just imagine, Tom, you know, you, you get the, <laughs> the, the notice on your phone that says, we're so sure that you want to buy the new five carat diamond for your wife for her anniversary, which is today. And we got that information by mining it from somebody who sold it to us that we've anticipated you're going to want to come in with her to the showroom. So we've already sent the Uber black limousine to your house. It's waiting outside. And now when your wife says, Tom, why is there a limousine outside? You've got to either explain yourself as to why you canceled it or put her in and bring her to look at the diamonds in our showroom. I could just see it. Or coming. the diamonds are in the limousine. Or they're they're it's there. A, it's a mobile diamond showroom. Yeah, the, the mobile showroom is, is already at your door. And, and, and by the way, your wife is in the back of the car looking at it. She's asking for you. It's, it's time for you to come out of the house and deal with this situation, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and thanks. By the way, P.S., you invented all of this in a podcast back in 2020 at, at, uh, or, or 21 is the case. Maybe. We're just barely into 21 as this is this is airing. So it's all your fault for inventing this on the podcast when that that starts to happen to us. Tom, I can't thank you enough for a great interview. But before I let you go, I want to ask you about two podcasts which you produce for, for SAP uh, in your role there as a futurist. This is exciting stuff. Please tell our listeners about both of them. Sure. So I have two podcasts, as you said. The first one is the Digital Supply Chain Podcast. And that's been going since uh, June, July, July. The first episode aired July 4th, if I remember correctly, in 2019. So it's been going 18 months now, 19 months. And we've published 95, 96 episodes, that kind of ballpark, depending on where this, when this podcast airs. And it is, it's, it's a podcast all around the digitization of supply chain, which is a topic which has seen a huge uptick in interest this year, particularly because supply chains have been so heavily disrupted by the pandemic. In fact, between uh, January and December, we saw a 10x increase in listenership to the podcast, which was phenomenal. And then the other podcast that I started in December of uh, 2020 is called the Climate 21 podcast. And the Climate 21 podcast is... You know, it's about climate, obviously. Uh, the 21 refers not to 2021, but it refers to the 21st century because it is a at least century long project to try and fix the climate that we've disrupted so badly. The aim of the Climate 21 podcast is to get on leaders who are, you know, doing successful climate emissions reduction projects, bring them on the podcast, have them share their wins to educate and inspire people to do similar projects. And I've had some very interesting guests on the podcast. One of the most recent ones was a guy called Lucas Joppa, who's the chief environmental officer of Microsoft. And what Microsoft have done in this space, I would have to say, is kind of gold standard. For example, in 2012, they rolled out an internal carbon price within the organization for everything. So anything, if you were in Microsoft anytime from 2012 on and you wanted to do anything, it included a price for the carbon that would be produced by whatever it was you were doing. So 
So if you were running an event or if you were buying office chairs or whatever it was, as well as the, as the standard financial price, there was also a carbon price. And that carbon price increased over time. And the money from that carbon price uh, was given to the sustainability organization within Microsoft to do things like to purchase renewable power, to set up new wind farms, to do all those kinds of incredible projects that they have been doing in the meantime. And then in 2020, they announced that they are going to go carbon negative by 2030 and that by 2050, they are going to remove from the atmosphere all of the CO2 they have emitted from the time they started operations in 1975. So, you know, and there's lots of other things they're doing. They've opened up a $1 billion fund to help startups who are in the carbon sequestration business because it is a very immature business and needs funding to make the technologies required for Microsoft to initially go carbon negative and to eventually suck all that carbon out of the atmosphere. So they're helping create the demand and also create the technologies they need to get them there. You know, so those are the kind of people who I have on the Climate 21 podcast. You can find that by going to www.climate21podcast.com or just open up your application, your podcast application of choice, search Climate 21 and it'll come up. Similarly for the Digital Supply Chain podcast, if you have an interest in supply chain, it's www.digitalsupplychainpodcast.com or open up your podcast app of choice, type in Digital Supply Chain and bang, there you go. Tom, thanks again for a terrific interview. My guest next week will be John Goldstein, who heads up the sustainable investing practice for Goldman Sachs. John has been a pioneer in the field of ESG investing for well over a decade, having co-founded Imprint Capital back in 2007, when ESG was barely a topic of conversation in investing circles. We'll discuss how John approaches ESG investing with a goal of having a direct impact and making the world a better place in the process. That's coming up next week on Smarter Markets. Listeners, please help us get the word out about Smarter Markets. It's not every day you come across a podcast with guests on the caliber that we bring you here on Smarter Markets, and we have a veritable who's who of industry legends lined up for interviews in coming weeks. Your ratings and reviews on Apple Podcasts and other podcast platforms mean the world to us, as does your help spreading the word about Smarter Markets via word of mouth. For the Macro Voices Podcast Network, I'm Eric Townsend. See you again next week for another installment of Smarter Markets. That concludes this week's episode of Smarter Markets. For free episode transcripts, visit smartermarketspod.com. Smarter Markets is 100% listener-driven, so please help more people discover the podcast by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform. Smarter Markets is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Smarter Markets should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Smarter Markets are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Smarter Markets, its producers, sponsors, and hosts, Eric Townsend and Abex Technologies, shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Smarter Markets. Markets.